For those of you unfamiliar with me and this project, I lost my daughter to suicide in June of 2023. Her death completely rearranged my reality. It is an event that tore me from who I was and bludgeoned me squarely into this new existence that I didn't ask for, an existence that I wouldn't wish upon any human. As I stumble forward in life, trying to make sense of things and figure out who I am now, I've leaned heavily into video games as both a comfort and a distraction. Gaming is a beloved pastime that I've shared with both of my kids for basically their entire lives. Allie and I played a ton of games together, like Stardew Valley, Animal Crossing, and Kirby. Perhaps video games are also special to many of you watching this and even help you feel a connection with someone you love. Losing someone you love more than anything, especially to suicide, forces you to think a lot about life, both the life that's behind you as well as what's ahead. I find myself trying to relate to my daughter during these periods of deep reflection, to think about what she was going through during that last period of her life. She was only 13 when she died. I try to put myself back in the headspace of being that age, and what better way to do so than by playing a game that I played when I was 13. A quarter of a century ago, the 3D era of gaming was sprinting out of the gate with nearly everyone I knew having either a Nintendo 64 or a PlayStation. It was during this era that a game would come along, one from a familiar series now boasting a darker, more serious narrative that would change my outlook on life forever, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Welcome to Gaming with Grief. Before we continue, I want to make a quick disclaimer. Majora's Mask is actually the first 3D Zelda game I ever played. Between the infancy of the internet and my own ignorance, Ocarina of Time somehow flew under my radar all those years ago. I played Majora several years before ever touching Ocarina. Because of this, there is a deep-rooted reverence of nostalgia that I have towards this game. We all have them. Those games that we played at just the right age, the ones that captivated us, that resonated with us, that changed the way we look at life. They became a part of who we are as people. We keep their warm memories tucked away in that special place in our hearts and perhaps even go back to dust them off and revisit them when life becomes too much to handle. Majora's Mask is one of those games for me. So yes, I do have a bit of bias in favor of this game in full transparency. This essay will likely reflect that. The game begins with young Link, fresh off his victory over Ganon in the events of Ocarina of Time, riding his trusty steed Epona through the woods of an unfamiliar land. He's on a new quest to find a lost friend, presumed to be Navi, his fairy companion from the previous game, and has found himself in the land of Termina. Link is not alone, however. He is being stalked by two fairies and the Skull Kid, now sporting an eerie heart-shaped mask. Link is ambushed and knocked off Epona. The Skull Kid helps himself to Link's sacred ocarina of time and begins playing with it, captivated like the young child he is at heart. Link gives chase where he is separated from Epona and eventually falls into a deep pit. He is again confronted by the Skull Kid who uses the dark magic of the mask to transform Link into a Deku, a race of small, plant-based people. Severed from his human form and desperate to regain what he's lost, Link continues forward where he meets the happy mask salesman. The salesman tells Link that if he can reclaim his ocarina, he can return Link to his human form and only asks for him to recover his mask from the Skull Kid as payment. Link, stuck as a Deku scrub, agrees and steps into Clock Town accompanied by the fairy Tattle on the hunt for the Skull Kid. One thing I appreciate so much about this game is that it was not afraid to focus on dark, serious life problems and include them as part of Link's journey throughout Termina. I'll touch on four of these themes throughout the video, the first being self-identity. The existential question, who am I, is as old as humankind. So many factors contribute to who we are as people, both how we see ourselves and how the world sees us. Perhaps a bit on the nose, but the game's mask mechanic is a perfect representation of this real-life question we all face. Each of the 24 collectible masks has Link assume the identity of other people he meets, checking mailboxes as a postman, commanding stall children as an undead captain, and even transforming into other races. All the spirits of Terminan... Terminan? Terminian? Terminian residents who have passed on. This concept is close to my heart. So much of my identity, my goals, aspirations, how I spent my time and energy, was devoted to raising and providing for my children. And now here I am, thrust into this new life without that role anymore. 
My son is now an adult and my daughter is gone from this world. The question, who am I, is one I ask myself every day. The events of our lives shape who we are as people, and loss of this caliber has completely stripped me of my identity. I suppose only time will tell who I become in this new era of grief. If you're going through something too, please give yourself some grace. It's okay to not like everything about who you are as a person right now, but it's critically important to deliberately love yourself. You deserve kindness while you figure things out and grow. Link and Tattle begin exploring Clocktown and talking to the residents to try to ascertain information on the Skull Kid's whereabouts. The residents are preparing for the annual Carnival of Time, a celebration where they don colorful masks and gather around Clock Tower, the centerpiece of the town. Though many are eagerly anticipating the festivities, some are weary. The moon, and the most unnerving iteration of the moon I've ever seen at that, seems to be getting closer to the earth. This has many people on edge, arguing over whether to even have the carnival at all. Many believe that the best thing to do is flee town. This brings me to narrative focus number two, despair and anxiety. That feeling of perpetual worry and dread that can settle in your stomach like a ball of lead can be truly a terrible part of the human experience. Some of us struggle with mundane things. A social gathering, a project at work, even a trip to the grocery store can leave a person paralyzed with anxiety. Endeavors like these can at times literally feel like the moon is falling. Majora's Mask exacerbates this feeling with a focus on completing things within a certain window of time, but I'll talk more about that in a bit. For now, whether you suffer from anxiety a little or it dictates every action in your life, know that you're not alone in that feeling. Don't feel compelled to suffer in silence. Link eventually recovers a stray fairy in town and returns it to the fairy fountain where the great fairy explains that the Skull Kid is the one who separated her in the first place. It seems she is not the only one afflicted by the Skull Kid and his wrongful deeds. Nearly every corner of Termina has been cursed to some degree. It becomes quickly apparent that Link has a lot of the Skull Kid's handiwork to undo and not a lot of time to do it. This is a great time to talk about another of the game's main mechanics, time. The events of Majora take place within a three-day cycle. Day changes to night, shops open and close, weather changes. The residents of Termina each move around and change behavior depending on the time of day. During the cycle, the player tries to accomplish as many events as possible before inevitably running out of time and resetting back to dawn of the first day by playing the Ocarina of Time. Major progression milestones, like collecting weapons and masks, will stay in Link's inventory but disposable and trade items will be lost during the reset. This semi-permanence forces you to strategically plan out each cycle, which areas to explore, people to talk to, and goals to accomplish. Failing to do so can have dire consequences. For instance, entering a dungeon on the third day of a cycle may not give you enough time to complete it, forcing you to reset the cycle and start the dungeon from the beginning. This system, in my opinion, is equally forgiving, however. If you make a mistake, say, miss talking to a key person during a quest on the first day, you always have a safety net to simply reset and go back and try again. Though not perfect, the time system of Majora's Mask is done well and incentivizes the player to explore Termina and devote time to talking to and helping its residents, enriching the immersion of the narrative. At midnight of the third day, the clock tower opens and Link ascends to the top to find the Skull Kid. After a brief exchange, Link recovers his ocarina and plays the Song of Time, returning to dawn of the first day for his rendezvous with the happy mask salesman. True to his word, he teaches Link the Song of Healing, my all-time favorite ocarina melody from this era of Zelda games. The Song of Healing does just that, heals even the most broken, weary soul upon hearing it. The song removes the Skull Kid's curse from Link, returning him to his human form. Additionally, the Deku form becomes that of a mask, and Link can use it to transform back at will. Having kept his end of the deal, the salesman prompts Link to return Majora's mask to him, which he obviously doesn't possess. Knowing the great evil that lies within the mask, the salesman flies into a frenzy, begging Link to go recover it from the Skull Kid. Recalling the words that Tails said on top of the clock tower, Link and Tattle set out to travel to the swamp, mountain, ocean, and canyon, though they are not entirely sure who or what awaits them there. The first locale they explore is the swamp, an expansive bog filled with poisonous water, man-eating plants, and giant octoroks. Link eventually reaches the Deku Palace, where he finds the Deku King, who has captured a monkey, 
wrongfully accusing him of kidnapping his daughter, the Deku Princess. Link sneaks around to the back of the palace where the monkey tells him that the princess is stuck inside of the nearby Woodfall Temple. The monkey teaches him the melody to open the temple, the Sonata of Awakening, and Link sets out for the temple to save the princess before the monkey meets an untimely end. It's worth mentioning that although Majora's Mask only has four main dungeons, half as many as Ocarina of Time, not counting areas like Ganon's Tower and Beneath the Well, Majora's dungeons make up for it with quality. Each dungeon is unique, immersive, and will give even a seasoned Zelda veteran trouble at some point. To me, an inherent quality of all good Zelda dungeons is connectivity, doing something in one part of a dungeon that affects the rest of it. This makes the player focus on the entire dungeon while they explore and make puzzle solving decisions rather than just clearing a room. I'll revisit this subject during some of the later dungeons, but let it be known that Majora's dungeons are nothing to take lightly. The Woodfall Temple puts Link's abilities as a Deku to the test, with several Deku flowers spread throughout it for both platforming and combat. Inside, Link finds the hero's bow, another indispensable tool used throughout the entirety of the rest of the game. The temple's boss, Odalwa, is a giant human-like mass warrior that wields a sword and shield. This is where it becomes apparent that Majora took a strong divergence from Ocarina and some of its enemy design. You see, most bosses in Ocarina, heck, in the entire Zelda series, have a very cut and dry method of disposal. Use the dungeon item, expose the weakness, often an eyeball, and mash your sword. Majora, however, created bosses where the weakness or best strategy to employ isn't always as obvious. In lieu of having one or two attack patterns, Odalwa has several. Sometimes he jumps, teleports or dances around, sometimes he swings his sword wildly, sometimes he commands legions of crawling insects that chase Link around the battlefield. Not only this, but he can be damaged by several methods as well. Sword, arrows, even bombs. This makes boss fights more interesting in my opinion, and even adds a bit of replay value, something Zelda bosses rarely offer. After Link defeats Odalwa and recovers his remains, the poisonous water of the swamp dissipates and the Deku Princess is rescued. She is returned to the king, the monkey is saved, and Link sets his sights on the next area, the mountains. Link traverses the winding snowy path to find the mountain village. A frigid, unnatural snowstorm has blanketed the entire area in thick snow and frozen its waters, leaving its residents cold, starving, and barely surviving. After talking with the locals, mostly of the Goron race, Link finds the Lens of Truth, a returning item from Ocarina of Time that allows the user to see through fake walls and reveals invisible platforms. He uses his new tool to climb a large cliff and finds Darmani, the spirit of a fallen Goron warrior. He recounts the tale of his demise to Link and begs him to lay his soul to rest and finish what he couldn't. Link again plays the Song of Healing, sending Darmani to the afterlife, leaving behind a mask that Link can now use to transform into a mighty Goron. This is a great time to pause and talk about this game's art. Though it reuses the same engine and many assets from Ocarina of Time, Majora's art style is noticeably darker than its predecessor. I sort of think of it this way. Ocarina is made to feel like an adventure. Majora's Mask is made to feel like a story. This isn't a negative thing in my opinion. It inadvertently provides a layer of comfortable familiarity that slightly softens the harshness of Terminus Darkness. It also showcases how clever the development team was. A great example of this is the chicken lady from Ocarina of Time's Kakariko Village. In this game, she is essentially a placeholder NPC that provides a short side quest to return her chickens to the pen. The development team could have used any generic NPC to do this, and although a perfectly fine use of the asset, didn't come close to utilizing its potential here. Fast forward to Majora's Mask, and the chicken lady is now Anju, one of the most important characters in Clock Town. She's the primary innkeeper at the Stockpot Inn, a locale that Link will visit several times on his adventure. She patiently cares for her elderly grandmother, bringing her meals she painstakingly prepares. Last but not least, she is the fiancé of Café, another Clock Town resident who has been affected by the Skull Kid's curse, turning his body to that of a child. Anju no longer idly stands next to a chicken pen, but is a layered character with a routine and priorities. Majora's Mask took an NPC and made her a person. This is just one example and again showcases that reusing assets can work if done thoughtfully. 
As you can see, I'm playing the Nintendo 64 version of the game as opposed to the much newer Majora's Mask 3D, developed by Grezzo and released for the 3DS. While I think Grezzo did a fantastic job of updating the art style while simultaneously paying tribute to Zelda's N64 era of graphics, I chose to play the original version for a couple of reasons. First, I wanted the experience to be as close to what it was for me when I was 13, and even back then, Majora pushed the N64 to its limit, requiring the memory expansion to even play the game. I also did a quick comparison of the two games before deciding which version to play, and as true as the 3D version is to the original, it is noticeably brighter and softer. Playing the original version, in my opinion, better highlights the game's darker parts of the narrative. After assuming Darmani's mantle and soothing an obnoxious Goron baby, Link climbs the long, twisting path of Snowhead and enters the next dungeon. The Snowhead Temple really amps up the complexity from the Woodfall Temple, its centerpiece being a huge vertical room with a pillar that Link must destroy pieces of to lower properly. Remember what I said earlier about dungeon connectivity. This is a great example. Additionally, with each dungeon comes the necessity of mastering a new form, of which Link now has three. Snowhead boasts many ice dungeon staples as well. Frozen enemies, sliding block puzzles, and plenty of ice to melt. Speaking of which, this dungeon's prize is the fire arrow, adding even more utility to Link's bow. The boss of the dungeon, Goat, is one of my all-time favorites in the entire franchise, turning your standard boss fight into one of the most nerve-wracking tracks in Mario Kart ever conceived. Link again defeats the boss and recovers the remains, returning the outlying area back to normal. The Thawed Land also now means that Link can upgrade his sword at the forge, something that's worth doing in this game as soon as you're able to. Continuing on, Link sets his sights on Great Bay, an expansive ocean area that the Zora race calls home. Almost immediately, Link encounters a wounded Zora floating in the bay, barely hanging on to life. Link pushes him to shore where he tells us that he was attacked by a local gang of Gerudo pirates while trying to recover the eggs of Lulu, the singer of his all Zoran band and presumed love interest. Link again heals him and vows to carry out his dying wish, yielding the Zora mask. The Skull Kid's malice has even reached this corner of Termina. Aside from the thieving pirates holding several of the eggs captive, a murky storm clouds the waters of Great Bay, making them completely unnavigable. Assuming the identity of Mikau, the fallen Zora, Link is able to piece together the secret location of the pirate's fortress and recovers the eggs. The newly hatched Zoran babies teach him the new wave bossa nova, which grants him access to the game's third dungeon, the Great Bay Temple. Since the Zoras have a strong connection to music in this game, what better time to talk about the game's sound design? As I've said before, sound design is such an important part of video games, especially games that focus on emotional narratives. Since video games rely primarily on two of our senses, sight and sound, what we hear while playing a video game is just as important as what we see, if not more so. A poor choice in music on the developer's part can be a scathing blow to the game's immersion, jarring the player into remembering, oh yeah, I'm playing a video game. Conversely, a good soundtrack will pull you in, and the Zelda series as a whole has a fantastic track record of doing just that. Veteran Koji Kondo returns to deliver another masterful catalog with over 120 tracks in total. Though many of these are again reused assets from Ocarina, they do not take away anything from the game, and there are enough new tracks to keep everything fresh. For example, Tracks like the Fairy Fountain, minigame music, and shop themes from Ocarina all make a return, but these tracks were so perfectly done the first time that there wasn't really any good reason to change them. The new tracks in Majora, especially its dungeons, are incredibly atmospheric and contribute well to the overall experience. While Ocarina focused on more traditional European-style sound utilizing lutes, guitars, and woodwinds, Majora incorporates many East Asian instruments like suonas, gongs, and sanchens, which are commonly used in Chinese opera. These instruments are pushed to the foreground with piercing sound and shifting tempos. Here, just listen to this. In addition to Mr. Kondo's work, Toru Minigishi contributes three new pieces for the game's battle themes. While these tracks are more aligned with Ocarina's sound identity, Toru's work is still worth noting. In summation, Majora's soundtrack perfectly fits the game. Light when it needs to be light, dark when it needs to be dark, emotional when it needs to convey emotion. 
The Great Bay Temple is a huge, elaborate water-churning machine with winding passageways, spouting geysers, and tangled pipework. As Link explores the mechanical labyrinth, he must turn switches to change the flow of water, master the Zoroform swimming and combat skills, and cross large pools of water using this dungeon's key treasure, Ice Arrows. One thing I noticed playing this game all these years later was how much of Majora's essence was carried over to future titles. Playing through the Great Bay Temple reminded me of Divine Beast Varuta from Breath of the Wild, especially the water wheel and freezing mechanics. Additionally, the mini-boss of this dungeon, Wart, is a very clear callback to Argus, the Swamp Temple boss from A Link to the Past. The boss of the Great Bay Temple is Georg, a giant fish monster that slams into the central platform and tries to knock Link into the water, where he can grab him in his mouth and do serious damage. After a few well-placed arrows and electric field charges as Azora, Georg is defeated, yielding his remains and returning the Great Bay area to normal. Link sets his sights on the game's final area, Ikana Canyon. One boss remains. Ikana Canyon and its surrounding areas dial Majora's focus on loss, regret, and grief to an 11. The entire area, from the graveyard to the music box house to Ikana Castle to Stone Tower Temple, is a barren wasteland overrun with death-themed creatures. Insert another important theme here, death, loss, and grief. So much of Majora's narrative focuses on loss and how we move forward with it, not away from it. I used to view death and loss that way. You lose someone or something close to you, you feel bad for a while, and then you move forward. But that's really not how it works. I will never, ever move forward from the loss of my daughter. This grief is part of who I am now, and I have begun building a new life around it. I will carry it for the rest of my days on Earth because my love for her and my grief are one and the same. The fact that the Deku, Goron, and Zora masks are all created from fallen denizens of Termina is just representation. It's important to also highlight that grief is not just the loss of someone to death. Perhaps you've become sick or disabled in some way and grieve the loss of your health. Maybe you've lost a job or a means of self-identity, like your ability to pursue a beloved hobby. So much of the human experience revolves around loss of many kinds and degree. Maybe you haven't lost a person in the same way that I lost my daughter, but I bet if you stopped and thought for a second, it wouldn't take long for you to find someone or something you've lost in your life, perhaps even a part of yourself. Unlike the other areas of the game, virtually no humans or Hylians reside here, aside from Pamela, a young girl locked indoors who refuses to come out, and who can blame her? Link enters the grave of Flat a long-deceased composer of days past, and learns the familiar Song of Storms, allowing him to call upon rain. He plays the song for Sharp, Flat's brother, who gave in to dark temptation and has been sentenced to an eternity of unrest. The song not only eases Sharp's soul, allowing him to pass on, but the waters of the storm begin turning the wheel of the music box house, filling the air with an up-tempoed yet uneasy melody that drives the patrolling Gibdos back underground. Pamela leaves the safety of the house to investigate, giving Link the opportunity to sneak in. In the basement, a closet door flies open and out pops a grotesque, half-mummified man, groaning in agony. Playing this as a kid scared the absolute crap out of me, but then again, that's the whole point I suppose. Link again plays the trusty song of healing, removing the curse from Pamela's father and giving him a mask for his troubles. This part is so terribly sweet. The way Pamela runs into her father's arms and tell him that he wasn't doing anything wrong, thinking about this child and how strong she had to be, staying isolated from the world outside while contending with her dad's curse, there really is no love quite like that between a father and daughter. Of all the people that Link helps during this game, these two are my favorites. Donning the new Gibdo mask, Link explores an area underneath the canyon where he finds the mirror shield. The mirror shield allows him to reflect beams of light to activate wall switches and dissolve sunblocks, giving him access to Ikana Castle. This mini dungeon of sorts has Link battling undead creatures and reflecting light to eventually reach the chamber of the undead king of Ikana. After dispatching the king and his two servants, Link learns the Elegy of Emptiness, a haunting ocarina melody that allows him to create hollow clones of himself to hold down multiple switches at once. Again, can we just take a second to appreciate how beautifully sad and even grotesque these husks are? I love the art style of this game. Link uses his new ability to ascend the canyon and reach Stone Tower Temple, 
the game's final dungeon. This dungeon deserves to be in the Zelda Dungeon Hall of Fame, and for good reason. It has it all. Tough enemies, detailed puzzles, and ample opportunities for Link to prove his mastery of his Deku, Goron, and Zora forms. On top of this, the dungeon's treasure, light arrows, can be fired at red gems that flip the entire dungeon upside down. That's right, this dungeon is essentially two dungeons in one. You have to be very conscious of space and object permanence when navigating this dungeon. The Stone Tower Temple also gives Link a bonus transformation mask, the Giant's Mask, allowing him to grow to an enormous size and level the playing field against the dungeon's boss, Twin Mold. With the Giant Worm duel slain, Link collects the final piece of boss remains. It is now time to return to Clock Town and face the Skull Kid. Atop the tower, the events of before replay, only this time, Link is able to call upon the four giants, having freed their spirits from within the masks of the dungeon bosses. One by one, the odd, torsoless behemoths appear from each of their respective regions of Termina, throwing their hands up and stopping the moon from crashing down. The Skull Kid, unable to endure the droning bellows of the giants, succumbs. Tattle and Tail are reunited. It seems the ordeal is finally over, or rather it would be, until the now sentient Majora's Mask sheds the Skull Kid from itself, claiming that the puppet is no longer needed. The evil deity, overflowing with dark magic, possesses the moon in an attempt to swallow up everything it failed to destroy in the crash. Left with no choice, Link sprints headfirst into the fray and is pulled into the moon. Instead of waking up in some turmoilish hell as you would expect, Link instead finds himself in a surreal, dreamlike, open field. The expansive meadow sprawls as far as the eye can see. A hazy filter blankets the air, making you feel even more disconnected from the reality we just left. In the center of the meadow stands an enormous tree. Link runs toward the tree to find children playing near it, young versions of the happy mass salesman, frolicking in circles adorned with masks of each of the bosses. Talking to each child transports Link to a short trial area, each based loosely on that boss's dungeon. Completing all four and giving the children the masks he's collected throughout the adventure awards Link the Fierce Deity Mask, the final transformation mask giving Link an adult form clad in armor that wields a giant sword. Though this form is really just a reskin of Adult Link from Ocarina of Time, its power and sheer coolness make it a worthwhile reward for collecting the rest of the masks in the game. Link talks to the final child, the one sitting alone under the tree wearing Majora's Mask, and the final battle begins. In usual boss fashion, Majora sports multiple forms during this fight. Majora's Mask, where it floats around with flailing tendrils. Majora's Incarnation, a one-eyed bipedal imp that sprints and dances around. And finally, Majora's Wrath, a strong beast form with giant whips for arms. Perhaps this fight would be more difficult if you don't collect all of the masks throughout the game, but with the Fierce Deity Mask, all three forms are dispatched quite easily. Majora, defeated at the hands of Link, dissolves completely. The moon returns to where it belongs in the sky, and the credits roll. In a post credit scene, the Skull Kid apologizes for his terrible actions. Tattle and Tail, though in disagreement at first, forgive him for what he's done. This brings me to my fourth and final theme, forgiveness. Forgiving is perhaps one of the most difficult things to do as a human. It's much more than just saying sorry. Forgiveness, true forgiveness, is a feeling that comes from within. It's a sincere feeling of peace that you must allow to settle deep in your heart when often all you want to do is remain hurt or angry. It only comes when you truly let go of how someone, perhaps even yourself, has done wrong. I've spent much time in the wake of my daughter's death being angry. I made an entire video about it. I've been angry with her for leaving us angry at the people in this world that treated her unkindly, and angry with myself for failing to protect her. I'm still angry. I may always have a little piece of anger that I carry with me. But like all the other parts of my grief, I've accepted it as the cost of having known and loved her. And because of it, I try to practice forgiveness every day. It's amazing to me that even after all these years, this game is still able to share such a dark, painful, brilliant narrative. When you hear Nintendo, you often think of games that are generally bright, happy, and silly. And Majora's Mask has these moments for sure. 
but to juxtapose it with this deep, somber story is nothing short of art. Playing it has allowed me to shift back in time to age 13, however briefly, and recount what the world used to look like through my eyes at that time. It's unfortunate that as much as Zelda is a beloved series in our household, my daughter only started to play Zelda games near the end of her life, and I don't think she ever got a chance to play Majora's Mask. Part of how I've decided to grieve is to salvage what I can of the life ahead of me and create memories and experiences to share with her when I meet her again in the next life. I'll keep trying to do the things she didn't get the chance to do while I'm still here, however long that may be. I can't end this video without taking a moment to thank all of you for the overwhelming response to my Amori video. I still can't believe that so many people have stopped to listen to what I have to say, help me honor the memory of my daughter, and work through my grief. There are literally thousands of comments from people just like you, sharing your own experiences with grief and loss, opening up about your own mental health, or even just spreading love and positivity. The world needs more of that. And to those of you that have taken it upon yourselves to say unkind things about me, my daughter, or other people in the comments, please remember that despite this being the make-believe land of YouTube, there are real people on the receiving end of those remarks. I know a lot of that nastiness is directed outward because you yourself have been through, or perhaps are currently going through, something terrible. I'm truly, deeply sorry for that. I hope you're able to find some help. I hope you're able to get yourself out of that situation and into a better life. I sincerely love you and wish you peace. Please keep that close to your heart the next time you want to write a terrible thing about a person you don't know to try to make yourself feel better. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. I received a laundry list of other games to play that are in the works, but as always, I would love to hear more in the comments. Until next time, be patient, be kind, and love yourself. See you soon.